I don't want to hit the mic. about uh, my journey to veganism, if that's okay. Um, uh, I spoke a little, I referred a little to um, my upbringing. I grew up in New Brunswick, 
spent a lot of time on a farm of uh, one particular set of relatives. Um, Is that all? No. Uh, no, it might not be, but that's okay. Can you hear me anyway? Yep. Okay. And uh, it was a really uh, brutal situation. Um, there was a mink farm. There were domestic animals, cows, horses, and such, chickens, uh, cats and dogs, uh, um, a mix. Um, and the violence uh, perpetrated on the animals, it, I would liken it to a concentration camp for animals because apart from the overt abuse there was tremendous deprivation of uh, basic, basic needs. Um, for example, there was a pump for water and a big trough and there would be cows standing in an area with no shade and uh, just bare sand, dry earth. And uh, I had to be careful where my uncle, who turned out to be my father, I found out years later, um, if I used the pump to pump the water in the trough, at which point the cows would hobble on shaky legs, being so emaciated to get to the water that was available in there, but the pump had a squeak. And if I had to be careful where my uncle was on the farm, because if you heard that squeak, uh, the punishment was very severe. So what I learned was to not speak for animals overtly, but to covertly alleviate their pain and suffering uh, as a child, unprotected myself, uh, to try and do what I could um, for them. And it was a pretty hopeless situation. Um, so I'm fast forwarding now, and uh, at some point in a, a subsidized housing area, a very rough school situation, someone came around with musical instruments and uh, said, did anybody want to play? And I was the only person that put up my hand, and I get sent home with a violin. So that saved me, I think, the music covering the broad spectrum of the most joyous to the most touching upon the most and deepest um, suffering that we can experience um, on this planet. So uh, uh, at some point I became vegetarian, um, but when I reached my 40s everything came to a head and I did here in Toronto make an attempt on my life and ended up in the emergency of the hospital, Toronto Western, I was told by a very black doctor with very white teeth that I would be all the stronger for this experience. So even though I still didn't want myself and didn't want to be here, what I got was something in life must have wanted me to be here because it didn't work. And so that was enough for me. I still didn't really want to be here. I was not really committed to my life. I was going through the motions. My heart wasn't in it. And then it was in a plane crash, 2005, Air France. And that bumped me into a place of really looking death in the face, looking at my childhood, at what I had not done enough of for the animals. Maybe for good reason. I was a child. I was not conscious uh, adult and such, but I, I felt if I had one regret as I thought I was going to die that afternoon, it was really about the animals. Most people say you should think about your family at that time. I should have been thinking about my daughter. But I thought about the animals and that's what really was the most painful for me about leaving the planet and not having done what more, more. Um, I think we have, we have a microchip that is said human beings and it's called our conscience. And there is an expression that those who have the privilege of knowing have the responsibility to act. And at some point, that microchip was chipping in, was, was becoming apparent that, that okay, I'm not a child anymore, and, and I've got to face what was the nightmare of my childhood, what caused me, in fact, to lose faith in my humanity, uh, my species um, uh, and the situation with the animals where I was able to 
uh, take, make an attempt on my life in my lowest moment. After the plane crash, I had the, I, I knew what it felt like to have something else take my life. It was one thing to choose to take my own life, but it was another thing, for whatever reason, to think it would be taken from me. And that made me also think about the animals in the sense that they do not have the option of ending their suffering. They cannot commit suicide when it's too much, when it's unbearable. And when I think of that, my head just wants to spin right off my shoulders, that they cannot alleviate their own pain even in getting off and out of the situation. But when my life is being taken, I see a lot of animal, uh, a lot of uh, posters and such saying, um, nobody wants, nobody wants to die. Um, and so that hit something home. It also was in the kind of the culture of death in the throes of death with that plane crash. Uh, we did survive, it, it, it is another story. But I needed to be in life. Uh, I, uh, and so that bumped me into vegan foods and into the raw vegan foods, the plant foods, because of the life they represented and such. And then that's when my graduation paper out of the trauma of the plane crash became, became my solo vigil that I did for two and a half years at what used to be called so-called quality meat packers, the Toronto Slaughterhouse. So I started showing up there every Sunday uh, for two and a half years, almost two and a half years before uh, just in the, um, as, as Toronto Pig Save was just having its inception. Uh, and in fact, Anita asked me to come and speak at the very first meeting, very small meeting in her home uh, which was to become the beginning of Toronto Pig Save, Cow Save, and Chicken Save, and so on. Um, because I had done the vigil at least, I think, for about two years until that point, and I'd given a talk at Brock University at the Conference for Animals about what my vigil was about. Um, so what, what I'd like to say in terms of activism is uh, at that time, I, I heard that I was being accused of not being uh, a team player. And it's not that I wasn't a team player. It's that this was my solo journey. This is my solo journey with the helplessness of my childhood, meeting the adult me in a very, um, in a more, with more resilience and with the capacity to manage my sensitivity and my vulnerability in, in a way that could uplift the situation. Um, I would say I'd like to share with you the, the most powerful moment I had in those two and a half years was with right up in the, in the truck. Uh, I was, had my head in the truck where they were beating the pigs off the crossover point between the end of the truck and the slaughterhouse. There were actually two pigs caught where one pig, there's only room for one to pass. And they, there's a man who kept beating both the pigs. They were both squeezed together, they couldn't move. So I was screaming for them to stop and so on, at which point the, the police were called and so on. And, but I had a few quiet moments after the beating stopped, everything stopped until the police were to arrive, nobody was doing anything. And I, I was standing next to a slaughterhouse um, supervisor and he said to me um, who are you anyway some stupid fucking psycho bitch and I didn't answer that I just stayed silent uh, I, I had as Harold Brown if any of you know Harold Brown I asked him I, I show up I have one hand over my heart I don't, I'm not with a group, I don't have any cards, I don't have any info, I'm just a presence there, just in my heart, just witnessing, and I don't say very much, I just, in fact, I listen if anybody wants to converse to me and approach me, which people did. But anyway, having said this, a slaughterhouse worker went from screaming at me, who are you, some kind of um, uh, uh, psycho bitch, uh, fucking psycho bitch, um, to, Quietly looking down, and he, and he, he said to me, without looking at me, looking down, as I stood beside him, he said, 
I have nightmares, you know, we all do. And to me that was a jewel because in my childhood I only saw the brutality and I was always looking for some humanity and I couldn't seem to find it. I couldn't seem to find that there was that microchip, however deeply buried. And I think that's why the suicide attempt because I was in total despair about that. And when he said that I have nightmares, you know we all do, meaning all the people at that slaughterhouse, everybody involved, I'm assuming he meant. When he said that, it was like a bridge for me. It was a bridge from my aloneness to feeling the human condition, which is the perpetuation of brutality on each other within our species and how that causes that to leak out and leak onto anything that is more helpless uh, than we are. And it was, it was the beginning of something for me. And I was so glad I was there for him because it sounded to me like that, that came from a very deep place in him. And if we don't show up as witnesses and we're not compassionate according to the whole situation, um, then we're not going to be as effective as we might, might be, I think. Those kinds of jewels that are buried that might come forward. I also showed me that I had my hauntings. I had been haunted my whole life, and sometimes I'm, I'm still haunted, uh, not only at night, but in the daytime. Uh, but that when we don't act in accordance with our integrity, when, our con when we have the information, and we can see the film footage, and we've internet now, we can't, without paying a very high price of nightmares and being haunted, not take action, no matter what the situation is. So uh, I've been haunted, to just bring it to the Palestinian situation, I've been haunted by that for a lot of years and not known, really, what to do about it. And seeming so far away and such... So that's why I feel so honored that life has come together to have, as Zach mentioned, my coming and playing tonight, um, and that my violin sustained me through that brutality, and now it's becoming my instrument. I see if I can continue with it, because I stopped for 30 years, 25 to 30 years, I put the violin away and couldn't play it anymore because I was so devastated at how we are on this planet. And it's an instrument of resonance, very beautiful. And you cannot play a violin if you don't play it from your heart. It's just not possible. Uh, for me, it was not. So I just, I put it away from one day to the next in the case, and I didn't open that case for 25 years, and then on and off. It's uh, just been two years now that I've... So it's, what I'm saying, it's become a, was my salvation growing up, the music. And then it became my, a, a kind of curse because I couldn't do it anymore. And I played professionally Hamilton Philharmonic, Royal Winnipeg Ballet, Touring Orchestra, Atlantic Symphony, Scotia Symphony now. And I went from playing and having studied so many years to nothing. Um, and then now it's becoming like a voice, I hope, like playing for Nard, playing a little bit for this, or just, it's a way through to speaking to people. Um, and I'm seeing it that way now. Uh, when I play anywhere. So life is really, comes around, like it's, it's pretty miraculous that we're still here and it's miraculous that I'm still here by the grace of something, God, go I, I would say. So anyway, that's, uh, I think that's a lot <laughs> that I said. Um, yeah, that animals can't commit suicide was a very important point to me to make. And there might have been others, but um, maybe that's, that's got to be out of it. Maybe I'll close with just playing a couple of other numbers. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. yeah? yeah. Okay. Thank you. Is it the microphone or a Yeah, I, yeah, I don't need that. Whoops, I'm yeah, sorry. No. I don't, I don't.